here. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Casey Satteray. I am the Donor Stewardship Coordinator at Washington's National Park Fund, and it's my pleasure today to moderate today's trip to Olympic National Park. Um, it looks like we've got a few new faces. So first, I'd love to tell you a little bit about our organization. Washington's National Park Fund is the official philanthropic partner for Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Our six-person staff and 23-person board of directors work hard to support the parks in so many ways. We have strong engagement with the parks and park superintendents as we work to fund many priority projects every year. Through all of this work, our vision is to see that our parks are strong and vibrant, youthful and everlasting. Now, before we start, I have a few housekeeping items. This trip is 45 minutes long with a 30 minute presentation from our speaker and a Q&A portion at the end. Feel free to enter any questions in the box below as we go. Um, we also have closed captioning available, uh, which you can access at the bottom bar of your Zoom window. You may need to adjust the font size in your Zoom settings as well, so just an FYI. Um, and we welcome any feedback as we work to make these trips as accessible as possible. So is your pack ready? Hiking boots on? Are you ready to board the virtual bus and travel over to Olympic National Park? Uh, first about our speaker, Nate Brown. Nate Brown grew up in the Midwest, but has adopted Washington as his chosen home. He served in the active duty army for 13 years. He graduated this year from the University of Washington with a BA in history, and he is an Alpine adventure photographer, as you'll learn today through his presentation. Nate is a climber and photographer behind the Olympic Mountain Project, and we are so excited to hear more from him today. Nate, feel free to take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Casey. Uh, I just want to first like start by saying thank you to the Washington National Park Fund for having me on today. Um, I'm really, really passionate about our three national parks here in Washington, especially the Olympics, because I'm completely biased towards them. But uh, all three are just world class. And, you know, any chance that I can get to work with an organization that does uh, great work for for those national parks is just an opportunity that I'm always going to uh, to jump at. Uh, so let's go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, and present. So, um, welcome to the Olympic Mountain Project. This is a project to climb 30 peaks within the Olympic Mountains. Um, and uh, to start us off here, this is probably one of the most iconic uh, Olympics views that, that uh, if you haven't been there personally, you've probably seen this before. This is a, a self-portrait of, my, of, of myself used, using a tripod, uh, standing on the summit of Mount Eleanor, looking at Mount Washington in the background, um, which is one of, the, one of the most popular peaks in the Olympics to climb. Um, so to orient in, uh, all of us, just in case we aren't all familiar with the great state of Washington, here is what Washington looks like. And then so running north to south here, uh, you have the Cascade Mountain Range. Um, but we are over here on the left in this small little cluster of mountains on the Olympic Peninsula that is bordered by the Pacific Ocean on the west, the Strait of uh, Juan de Fuca on the north, and then the Puget Sound to the east, creating a, a little peninsula. Um, if we zoom in a little bit, so we this is now the Olympic Mountains um, themselves. And so as you can see, it's just kind of, it's a circular cluster of mountains, which is not what we typically think of. We think of mountain ranges. And um, I have the quote, you know, down here by Edmund Meany, and he says that the mass of mountains has no general access, and it is therefore hardly proper to use the word range as part of the name. And that's just one of the many ways that the Olympic mountains are just kind of very unique uh, in that they, they present a challenge for somebody who wants to climb mountains, because the great thing about having a nice mountain range like the Cascades that runs north to south is that you have a bunch of roads that go 
that crisscross, you know, in between all the mountains, giving you giving people a fairly easy access. However, with the Olympic Mountains here, the, the problem is that there is no road that goes through this this cluster of, of mountains. So if you want to get into uh, the mountains, the only way to do it is by foot. Um, so that's a, uh, a challenge presented to, to mountain climbers. Um, so first, let's let's uh, before I get any, any deeper, let's uh, ask you know how were the Olympic Mountains formed? You know why are they so different? Um, so you should have a pop up box uh, giving you a couple different options. Go ahead and um, choose the one that you think is right. And just take a couple more seconds. Gather. All right. Okay, so most, most people got it right. We got 83% said that the uh, tectonic plates collided, the North American and Wanda Fuca, and that is correct. Um, some people chose uh, the volcanic activity formed them, and that is how the Cascades are formed. That's how most mountains are formed is uh, volcanic activity. So let me show you a little infographic here. Um, so what we have kind of taking you back to uh, your earth sciences that you, that you took uh, back in school, um, what we have here is two different plates, uh, the North American plate and the Pacific and, and Juan de Fuca plates, actually three plates, all colliding into each other. And they are creating the mountains. So if you think about the, the coast range here, that's the Olympic mountains. If a, a really great analogy is if you have an Oreo cookie and you separate the Oreo cookie and you have all the cream filling on one wafer and then the other wafer is bare. If you were to take those two wafers and then just scrape them against each other with the wafer with, or with the cream filling on the top, what's going to happen to that cream filling? It's going to just kind of pile up where, where the two wafers are colliding. And that's exactly what's happened with the Olympic mountains. So uh, they're in fact very different from the Cascades in that they are not created by the volcanic activity that, that dominates the Cascade range, but they are a really ancient seafloor. Um, so the, another reason that the Olympics are a, uh, um, a particular challenge to climbers is that they are notorious for being really crumbly. Um, the, the rock can just kind of at, at times just disintegrate in your hands and that's, you know, makes for, for very poor climbing to, to, to be very, very honest. Uh, and that's because it's just a totally different, it is ancient seafloor bed and not, you know, the nice like hard granite of the North Cascades, for example. Um, this mountain right here is the is the aptly named Tilty Mountain because uh, <laughs> it is very tilty looking. Uh, th this is up by the Hurricane Ridge area um, in the north, and this is just like an excellent visual representation of showing what used to be uh, ancient marine um, uh, bedrock layers. Um, so. Going forward to the project, you know, how did, you know, a project, how did a desire to climb 30 peaks in the Olympics even come about? And it came about with a very simple question. It's a question that I receive a lot, um, especially being somebody that's not born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. I came here from the Midwest, like Casey said. And um, so whenever I have people, fellow out of towners come in, they always ask, you know, pretty much the same question. Like, what is your favorite place here in Washington? And ever since I've been here, which is since uh, 2013, uh, my answer has always been the Olympics. I, I always tell them, go to the Olympics, go to the Olympics. They are incredible. Um, so I had uh, several years ago, I had a friend in town and he, he asked me, he was, he was over at my house and asked me, you know, what, which was my favorite area. I said the Olympics. And I had one of those big giant paper maps, like the ones that you fold out and they're, they're huge. They're so big. You have to just lay it on the floor and then just kind of step into it from there. Um, and I was pointing out on the map all of all of my favorite. Oops, let's uh, go back. Oh no, what just happened? Um, technical difficulties. Oh my goodness, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be uh, twenty twenty one if we didn't have technical difficulties. Perfect. So yeah, let me go back to this map right here. Um, so as I was laying out, you know, all of my favorite places, I was talking about, you know, that down here in the south uh, east corner, the Lake Cushman area. There's some stuff here on the eastern side, like uh, Marmot Pass. You know, those are all excellent. And then up here in the north, you have the Hurricane Ridge area. And I said, you know, these are all my favorite areas. And as I was saying that, you know, it, it wasn't 
known to my friend, but it, I was kind of connecting the dots. I was only pointing to areas on the outside of the um, of the the mountains. So I claimed that it was my favorite area, and yet looking at a map, I you know you you could you couldn't really say that I'd even seen half of the Olympics because they're just so difficult to get into. And that's what started the the gears turning in in my head about well, how do I go about uh, seeing these mountains? Um, so going back to this map here, this is all 30 peaks um, listed listed on the map there. And if you're wondering why some of them are green and five of them are red, because that is my current status with the project. I have 25 peaks completed that I have climbed in the project, and I have five remaining. Um, so you can tell by the way that they're spread out, that's kind of, that's how I decided what peaks I wanted to climb. I wanted to be able to, at the end of the project, say that I had seen the entire Olympics, not climbed every single peak because that would take an entire lifetime to, to accomplish and, and then some, but I, I could honestly say that I had been through all of the major river valleys. I've been on top of every major mountain ridge um, and I could with, with full heart and, and an authority say that, yes, I, I have seen the Olympics. Um, so this shows all the little red squiggly line shows, gives a little bit of a better idea of this is everywhere that I've had to travel to get to these peaks. Um, as I said, there's no roads that go through the, the mountain complex. Um, so that's, that means that, you know, I have to start on the outside edges and work my way in. All right, with all that being said, I do have a six minute video here. It shows all of the, the, the highlights of those 25 mountains that I have climbed so far in a variety of seasons. Um, I'm going to make sure that you guys can hear my, yes, you can hear my sound and welcome to the Olympic mountains.
<laughs> yeah, buddy. Okay. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that video. That is the culmination of about two years worth of climbing and a lot of different seasons, as you can see. Um, so one of the main questions that I get when climbing Olympic mountains is like, well, what's involved? Uh, and there's usually a mix of or, or all of the, the above here. So what you can see on your screen is just one of my friends hiking on a normal trail. And that's how most climbs begin. Uh, staying on a trail is, is most preferred because it is the most efficient form of travel and it's also, um, you know, follows leave no trace and everything. But when climbing to the summits of these mountains, uh, there are very, very few that have a trail all the way to the top. So eventually uh, you have to leave the trail. And then in the Olympics, that looks like this photo, a lot of bushwhacking. Uh, which is of all of the forms of travel in the mountains is the most frustrating and the one that I, I look forward to the least. Uh, it's very slow going, it's hard to see, and sometimes the, uh, the, the plants around you are, are literally fighting back, especially if you found yourself somehow in the middle of a thicket of Devil's Club, which are just these really, they're, they're as nasty as the name implies. Um, but eventually, after all of your hard work of bushwhacking, uh, you will get into the upper alpine regions where you're, you're either at treeline or above treeline and, and you can see and, uh, and move around a, a, bit, a bit more faster. Um, and then uh, eventually, as you get higher up into the mountain, depending on the season, it is either rock scrambling like this photo from uh, climbing Mount Deception, the second highest peak in the Olympics, um, or this photo of Mount Washington in the winter time. It could be a combination of rock, snow, ice. It really just kind of depends on the uh, time of year. And then finally, some of the climbs actually require uh, roping up. In this photo, we are standing at the base of Mount Olympus. Uh, so Mount Olympus is great because it uh, is glacier, both glacier travel that you have to be roped up for, and then the summit itself uh, has some alpine rock climbing routes where you uh, climb and then rappel down off of. So you could, inc you could uh, in a single climb, in a single trip, you could go all the way from, you know, on, on trail to bushwhacking through the rainforest to in the high alpine areas uh, doing rock climbing. So there's one of the reasons that I wanted to do the project over the course of several years, as opposed to trying to complete it as quickly as I possibly could, was so that I could experience everything that the Olympics has to offer, no matter what time of year. Uh, so in these four images, you can kind of see the, the four different seasons. In the first image we have, this is very much springtime. Uh, we have snow left in the mountains, but they're really kind of, it's just patchy and, and uh, and in the high alpine areas. And then in the second photo, it's the summertime where pretty much all snow has, has completely disappeared. And uh, we have what's what's called a choss, which is just basically very loose rocks. If you, you probably saw in the video, there was, uh, it was, the video was focused on my feet and I was just kind of sliding down all this really loose rock and that's choss uh, and, and scree is another name for it. Um, when you're kind of sliding down it like that, it's called scree surfing which is just kind of a, a funny way of, of saying something that's otherwise a little nerve wracking. And then um, because the, the Olympics, you know, doesn't have too many deciduous trees, we don't have too much of a fall season. The fall season in the Olympics is really just kind of moving. Uh, like you see in that third photo, uh, you know, we're not getting any, there's no larches like, like you have in the Cascades that would turn, turn yellow or anything like that. You do have a little bit of color change in the Olympics, but, but predominantly the, the, the fall, uh, season in the Olympics is is just rude, and then to uh, to winter. Um, so one of my favorite things about this project has been going back and climbing the same mountains several times. So uh, though I've completed twenty five of the thirty mountains, I have climbed uh, six of those mountains multiple times in both the summer and the winter time. So you may recognize this photo. This is another very popular spot within the Olympics. This is the Upper Royal Basin. And that mountain uh, in the background is Mount Deception, the second highest peak in the Olympics. And this is taken in uh, September. 
pretty much when um, you've got the least amount of snow in, uh, during the year. And then I went back to this exact same spot in March for a ski trip with several friends and just so that we could see the area, see what it looks like in, in, in the middle of the winter. And it was just absolutely gorgeous. I, uh, I love them both, but I tend to I tend to favor the winter months is just aesthetically looking like I just the, the mountains covered in, in fresh snow is uh, it's pretty stunning. Um, this was definitely the winter trip uh, to the Upper Royal Basin on skis was one of my one of my favorites of the project so far. Um, this is another extremely popular view. If you haven't been here personally, you've probably seen a photo. This is from Mount Storm King. Um, up in the north, this is Lake Crescent down below, and then off in the distance, you can even see uh, that's Victoria, uh, the ba Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Um, so this is another one example of, of a peak that I did uh, in the winter time, just so that I can get the, the that contrast of the seasons. Now there are four seasons, um, but there's been kind of uh, a one of those sad jokes that's been starting to, to be made out here in the West uh, that we have a fifth season. Um, we got a little a little hit of that um, about a week ago, and that is fire season. Um, so this Mount Storm King is, is probably the easiest peak that I have on the project. It's very accessible. It's, it's a very short hike. Um, and when last year, uh, when the uh, smoke levels were really bad. Typically the Olympic Peninsula is is shielded from from uh, the smoke. Typically the Cascades gets the worst of it because we have on the Olympics we have that really nice fresh uh, marine air that's typically keeping the skies clean clean. But um, last year, if you were here, you may recall that even the Olympic Peninsula was not spared from the smoke. And this is a photo of uh, Mount Storm King taken taken last summer uh, with myself there in the in the front. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend doing this, what I did, uh, I I'm wearing, you could probably see I'm wearing a mask. I'm actually wearing two masks. I, I put, put, put them on in this case to, to help try to filter out as much of the uh, smoke particulate as I could. But, um, I knew that I needed to get a photo of, you know, what's, what this is, you know, this is not, it's not a beautiful photo. It's, it's more sad than anything, but it is, it's telling a story. And um, I would I would have been remiss if I didn't capture that, you know, especially while this is happening in the midst of me accomplishing a, a, an Olympic mountain project, which is seeking to document and, and show these mountains. So here's some frequently asked questions that I get um, about the project quite a lot. Uh, probably the, the, the number one is what is my favorite mountain to climb in the Olympics? And that is the one that you can see in this photo. However, you may not recognize it because it's taken from a vantage that uh, is not typically seen. This is Mount Olympus but seen from the south. Uh, I am on the skyline traverse uh, during, during when, the, when I took this photo. And um, that's been one of my other favorite uh, things about the project is that I get to see, you know, mountains, depending on what area you're viewing it from, can look dramatically different. Um, you know, Mount Olympus is, uh, as we typically, see it you know from this this image right here this is standing on top of the uh the glacial moraine looking down you have the blue glacier in front of you which is the largest glacier in the olympics and you can see that mount olympus all the all the various peaks there the the peak the actual summit the tallest of them is is doesn't look like the tallest in this picture it's way in the back there if you can see my cursor um but that's another thing that a lot of people don't know about Mount Olympus is that it's not a single point, you know, kind of like uh, like Mount Rainier is, for example. It actually has several summits, um, and uh, and there, there's one that's slightly higher than the rest. Um, but this is my favorite peak to climb because it it offers a variety. So when you you start off and you're in the whole rainforest, like you see in this photo, and it's just like it's it's fern gully. You know, myself growing up in the Midwest, I I had never. You know, the only thing, the only times that I'd ever seen scenes like that was in that movie, uh, animated movie kit for made for kids a long time ago, uh, and and uh, it still just like takes my breath away every time I see these, these gorgeous, just green green sites. And then you go from that to standing on this this glacial moraine, looking at this huge, you know, glaciated, uh, multi-peaked massif, 
And then as you're climbing it, um, you turn around and then there's just all of those Olympic mountain layers in the background. I, I, it really is. It's the crown jewel of the Olympics without a doubt, but in my opinion, it is the crown jewel of, of Washington for peaks to climb because you just get such a, a variety of experiences with it. So here's another poll for you. Um, what did the indigenous people of uh, the Olympic Peninsula call Mount Olympus? You have uh, four options here, Sanadu, Tahoma, Wai East, or Everest. Let's see how we all did. All right, 67% got it right. It is Sunadu. Sunadu is the original name of Mount Olympus before uh, a, a British uh, captain came by, saw it, and proclaimed it Olympus. It was known as Sunadu for, for much longer than that. Tahoma is, of course, the indigenous name for Mount Rainier. And White East is the indigenous name for uh, Mount Hood. And then Everest is in Nepal. <laughs> Um, so the most impressive looking mountain, which is different than my favorite mountain to climb, but uh, in the background here, we have, it's not really a mountain, but it's a, it just kind of a, a, a complex of peaks, little spires. It's called the Needles. This is looking down on the Needles from the summit of Mount Deception. Um, and uh, they're, they're kind of similar. If, if you're familiar with the North Cascades, they, they remind me a lot of the pickets. They are, they are the pickets of the Olympics for me. They're just this impressive uh, collection of spires that, that are just really gorgeous and look super uh, uh, challenging for, from a climber's perspective. I, I, that is probably a bit above my pay grade for, for climbing. I'm not sure that I would ever attempt to climb any of those. Maybe, maybe someday in the, in the future. <laughs> um, my favorite day hike, day hike to a mountain summit is uh, Colonel Bob way down in the south by Lake Quinault. Um, it's a relatively not as well-known one. It doesn't get the attention of say like Mount Eleanor or, um, or Hurricane Ridge, for example, but this photo is taken uh, in the early morning hours uh, during sunrise from Colonel Bob Peak. It's a very accessible day hike. Uh, I think it's, it's between six to eight miles round trip and a, at about 3000 feet of gain. It's very accessible and it's just absolutely gorgeous and underappreciated. The whole, the whole Lake Quinault area is really pretty. My favorite alpine lake is uh, the one that you see in this photo. This is called the aptly named Lake Beauty uh, because it is a beauty. Um, and this is taken on the, the skyline uh, traverse, which is a 45, about 45 mile, depending on how you do it. Um, uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a off, it's, it's not really a trail. It's, it's a route, um, uh, because it's, uh, sometimes a trail and sometimes you just kind of have to find your own way, but it's about 45 miles, uh, starting down in that Lake Quinault region. And it's just absolutely just stunning. My favorite season in the Olympics, uh, is, is the fall season. Uh, I really love it. You know, in this photo, like you've got the, like I said before, the, the mood is, is um, really kind of, I'm all about that. The moody trees, all my friends know that, they, you know, if there's uh, a really moody scene in front and while we're hiking along, they just know to go ahead and stop and take a snack break because I'm going to stop and get my camera out and just absolutely go to town. Um, this uh, photo is from Goat Lake in the Olympics. There, there is a goat lake in the Olympics. A lot of people you think that, oh, you mean the one in the Cascades, the very popular one there. No, this is this one is the Olympics one. So it's the, this like early where, you know, fall and winter and, and, and summer are all kind of colliding. There's a little bit of snow on the ground, but it's not to the point where you need to worry about snowshoes or avalanche equipment. Um, but it's still super cold, which I will always choose super cold over super hot any day, uh, because as you can see in this photo, I, I can put on, you know, nice big warm puffy coats and uh, have a hot drink like I have in my hand and just, just be happy. The longest single trip of the project so far has been my the Skyline Traverse plus climbing four peaks along the way. That trip um, 
uh, I climbed several peaks, including uh, Mount Seattle, which you can see in the background of this photo. And that peak, and that trip was 67 miles and um, over 20,000 feet of elevation climb. Uh, and I did that trip solo too, which was, um, you know, I do some of my trips solo, but I, I typically prefer to have people with me, but sometimes, you know, schedules just don't, don't always line up. But it ended up being really nice to just get out by myself for four days and really hammer out, you know, 67 miles is a pretty long, pretty long haul. And uh, I'm sure I probably would have been grumpy company anyway. So I got to just, uh, when in the middle of the day when it was hot and my legs were tired, I got to just, you know, whatever squirrel was near me at the moment, got a, got an earful <laughs> at the time instead of my climbing partners. Uh, my favorite hiking area in the Olympics, uh, if, if I had to say that there's just, if there's one area that you can just get, you know, plenty of hikes out of that's really great, that is the obstruction point uh, area. So it's if you go up the, to Hurricane Ridge and then you take a slightly sketchy road um, down to this area called obstruction point. And then from there, there's just a, a whole plethora of options. You know, you can, if you want to go to some lakes, there's Grand and Moose Lakes. There's uh, a lot of ridges that you can traverse. This one, we're doing the Lillian, Lillian uh, Traverse, uh, heading towards McCartan Peak to climb that one. Just absolutely stunning. And, you know, Hurricane Ridge, if you haven't been up there, it's uh, kind of like it's the paradise of the Olympics. Paradise being the, the area on Mount Rainier where you can drive really high up and just immediately be in the Alpine um, that's what the hurricane ridge and obstruction point area is like for the Olympics. You can drive up and you're just immediately you're, you're in it for, for no effort at all, which is just awesome. My favorite wildlife sighting. Normally it would be pikas. Pikas are my favorite mountain animal, but there are no pikas in the Olympics. Um, so for me, it's bears. I, uh, I, I used to be afraid of them many years ago and, um, I have since, you know, with which with an education and with getting gaining experience and how to how to act around the bears, I've become more comfortable. And I do want to also mention that I am not nearly as close to the bears as it looks uh, in this photo. I have very expensive, heavy, and nice camera that is allowing me to zoom in and, and observe them from a distance. Um, but uh, yeah, the black bear population in the Olympics, those are always my my favorite. I try to uh, I try to see at least one on every trip. All right, so that's going to take us a Q and A, Casey. Um, do we? What questions do we have? Yeah, let me uh, check on that real quick. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation, Nate. Um, I love that you can take us to places that we just usually don't get to see here at sea level. Um, let me see if I can pop up on screen here. Okay, here we go. Um, so folks, feel free to enter any of your burning questions down in the Q&A box or in the chat box if you feel that's fitting. Um, but I will open up with some that I have on my list real quick. Uh, obviously, you're not done yet with this 30 Peaks Olympic Mountain, Park, Mountain Project. Um, but what's one thing that you've learned about yourself um, throughout this entire project? What yeah, one thing I've learned about myself is that I, I motivation is a, is a constantly moving target. And I, I learned early on, I had a lot of pressure when I first started the project uh, about two years ago now to just like complete peaks as quickly as I possibly could. And I was getting burnt out pretty, pretty hard. And then the, the photos were, were as a result. Um, not not super great. So I've been just kind of embracing the um, the highs and the lows of the project. And also, I could have never. So I started the project in 2019, and I could have never anticipated that you know 2020 would happen, and the park was was closed for for quite a long time. It was closed from early April through late July. It was the of the three park national parks here in Washington. It was closed the longest. So just learning patience. Um, has been a, a, an excellent teacher, which the mountains are always an excellent teacher in patience and, and humility. I'm sure, yes. <laughs> um, a few people have actually asked, how many days did the 67 mile hike take? So I did that in four days. 
which was brutal. Um, I originally planned on doing it in five days, but I was just super motivated to get it complete. <laughs> and, uh, and I also had, because I was by myself, uh, I always have plan my plan A, and then I have a plan B, and I have a plan C, especially when I'm by myself. So uh, for example, I had planned on climbing, one of the four peaks that I uh, was climbing along that 67 mile trip was Mount Nini. Um, and I got to the point where I could actually see the route that I was going to go up and it was a hard no. There's no way that I would climb that by myself. If I had climbing partners with me, absolutely. It looked, it looked like a blast, but it was objectively looking at it. I'm like, no, I'm not going to climb that by myself. So I had a smaller peak already in mind, uh, that I would climb that, that peak instead. Uh, because the great thing about having my own list of peaks for the project is that I can change them however I see fit. I'm not using some uh, someone else's list where um, only peaks 6,500 feet uh, or, or higher. Um, so yeah, that was that was also allowed me to cut off a day because I did a slightly easier peak. Nice. Um, a few people are wondering how are you financing this project, or what does it take to you know fund this project of yours? Uh, it's mostly self-funded. Uh, it's, it's a passion project of mine. I do have support from uh, some, some generous sponsors. Uh, I'm sponsored by Helly Hansen, who provides all of my clothing. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty uh, thankful for that because I'm really hard on my clothing, especially during those bushwhack <laughs> sections where I will just rip a t-shirt apart. Um, and so, and then also uh, Nick Wax, is a big sponsor of mine. They 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 sell um, products to help keep your uh, tents and and Gore-Tex jackets and uh, all all of your things looking uh, new and water repellent and everything, which is also good because I just absolutely otherwise would destroy all my stuff. And the peninsula is notorious for all that rain, so I'm sure that's helpful. <laughs> absolutely, I have to, I have to retreat my my stuff uh, probably more often than I rightfully should be. Um, Glenn is wondering how much did your camera gear weigh usually? Did you have to make hard choices on what to bring? For example, heavy tripod or more lens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my my typical setup, if I if I'm just going with what I want to carry, it's about 10 pounds, 10 to 12 pounds of just camera equipment alone. Um, for some of those longer trips or uh, or for trips where it would be harder for me to swap lenses. Um, I can get that all the way down at the absolute minimum to like six or seven pounds. For example, if I'm climbing a peak like um, Mount Olympus where I'm tied into people, there's a lot of rock climbing involved. I don't have the time to change lenses. So I'll bring one lens. It's kind of like a, it's a 24 to 105 millimeter that kind of just covers, it's an all arounder, but it's not, you know, if, if left to my own devices, I will carry two or three lenses um, which of course I pay for in weight, but is worth it for the photos. <laughs> um, another question, it kind of is a culmination of several questions. Um, do you ever run into hairy situations? And if so, like, how do you save yourself, especially on solo hikes? Yeah, so the, the hairy situations is just part of being in the mountains. And that's why, again, I'm just going back to that, that plan A, plan B and plan C. Um, and I also carry an in, uh, Garmin InReach, which is a little satellite communicator, um, so that I can I can communicate uh, with people back home and make, you know tell them that everything's okay or everything's not okay, and then hit that SOS button, which I've uh, never had to knock on wood, but um, you know I, I have that in there as well. And then also just a healthy a healthy um, respect for the mountains and just realizing that sometimes it's just not in the cards. For example. Um, Mount Constance was was a real a real jerk to me on several occasions. Uh, it's one of the harder ones to climb and to route find. And uh, you know, like the first time that I went to climb it was with two friends, and we ended up taking a bunch of wrong gullies, and we lost a lot of time. Then one friend was having some leg cramps, so we we're just like, you know what, it's fine. It's not in the cards today. We'll come back, and we did. Um, you know, on another time. So it's just kind of having that uh, really healthy. Um, culture of no is, is, is what I call it. That's good. That's good. Um, one last question here from Sarah. She's curious, where is that photo behind you taken from? Uh, so this is actually taken down by Lake Cushman. Um, that is on the way up to Lightning Peak. 
I cannot recall the actual name of the trail, but if um, it's, yeah, it's, it's down there by Lake Cushman. And if you look up, uh, you know, where you go to, to climb Lightning Peak, this is the trail that you uh, approach on before you get up into the higher Alpine area and have to do a little bit of, a little bit of scrambling. But yeah, it's absolutely stunning. It's one of my favorite uh, green places in, in the Olympics. Absolutely, that is gorgeous. Well, thank you so much again, Nate. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time sharing your adventures with us here. Uh, last year, we gave over $650,000 in support of Mount Rainier Olympic and North Cascades National Parks in these four core areas. Um, we love having the support from donors, from friends, from photographers, from climbers, everyone, all of the above. Um, we are looking forward to more virtual field trips in the fall. Uh, they are in the works right now, but in the meantime, enjoy the rest of the summer in the parks. Um, if you would like to watch more of our virtual field trips or sign up for future ones, uh, you can find us online at wnpf.org slash field dash trips. Um, if you really enjoyed this topic, specifically mountaineering and photography, Scott Kranz did one with us last summer, um, and he talks about his 50 peaks in North Cascade. So feel free to check that out if you want to continue this conversation. Um, finally, if you're interested, interested in supporting our work, please visit us at wnpf.org. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you in the fall. <laughs>